Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining. Um, I am just, it's just always a pleasure to host this webinar um, where we showcase a little bit like what the students who, and the participants in the ESPIN, the like Earth Service Processes Modeling Institute in the summer um, have been up to. And um, to me, it's always such a a joy and a bit of a surprise, like how much people can um, pull off in such a short time as a team. Um, I see that it's um, like a lot of our like Aspen people's group um, are here and we have like a bunch of volunteers who are presenting on behalf of their teams. Um, so I'll introduce everybody um, as we go in like little blocks. Um, but I'm also like really pleased to see that some community members of the um, CSDMS community are joining to see what people um, have been doing. Um, so we'll so we'll have four blocks of different teams, and some are like a little bit of a combination of teams that worked as um, two teams. Um, and so um, each group is going to present about six six minutes uh, around. We'll have like questions after each group's presentation, and then we'll like move on to the next uh, team. Um, so the first two people who are presenting are Vivian Grom of like Louisiana State University and Pedro um, Oliveira, Silvestre, Oliveira um, from uh, Queens College uh, in the SUNY system. Um, and they'll be talking about DEMs, et cetera. <laughs> I'll let you introduce uh, Vivian. Okay, so should I share my screen? Okay. Um, let me know if you guys can see it. We're seeing it. Okay. Okay, so hi everybody. As Irina was introducing me, my name is Vivian. I'm a fourth year PhD student at LSU, and I will be presenting on the work that my group developed during Aspen, together with my colleague Pedro Oliveira. So our project is about um, DEM data compared to synthetic data in landscape evolution models, and we have a study case in the Teton Fault in Wyoming. And beyond me and Pedro, our B group was composed by Aysan, Anthony, Cho, Matthew, and Madison. So the project consists of two notebooks, one focused in performing the topographic analysis in a DEM-derived data set, and another one trying to mimic this first one from a landscape evolution model perspective, integrated with field data. So the main objective of the notebook is to help students gain practical experience in topographic analysis and model evolution, broadening their knowledge on a geological subject. In this case, the Teton Fault, an active normal 50 degree dipping fault located in Wyoming. So in the first notebook, the students will learn how to download data from Open Earthscape and clip the area that they're supposed to perform the analysis on. Then they will perform the analysis, extract the channel longitudinal profiles, the channel steepness, and chi plot. At the same time, as they learn what these metrics mean and how to interpret them. And in here, we have this print screen of the notebook and some of the analysis that the interactive code generates. So the first one is showing the DM, and this one in the lower part showing the, the chi analysis. And we, in here, we have uh, more print screens of the results of the extraction of the channel profiles in the map and showing their elevation. And after each notebook, we have a discussion guide that can be used by the instructor to discuss the concepts and implications of the topographic analysis. And now I'm going to pass the word to Pedro that will talk about the second part of the notebook. All right, thank you. Yeah, you can keep your screen, share, share your screen. Okay. All right. So, as you were saying, like we did the analysis on the real DM. So now we are gonna we're gonna work in a synthetic DM here. So the first things the students were to create like a stat state model, trying to simulate the 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 faults that they have. But first, without the fault, 
So as you can see here, it's kind of a stat state of our landscape. So we have the same as the the real DM. We have basins flowing east and basins flowing west, and we have this this mountain range in the middle, uh, north south. So and the longitudinal profiles that you can see is directed from that. They're on kind of on the stat state. Uh, so next, please. So here it's something that we include in our project. So here we have this function, this class is feed work data. So the students here, they will import like an Excel spreadsheet that they have all the track and the, the strike and dip data from the from like a field trip. So imagine the students go on a field trip and then they have a lot of measurements from the fault, this, this real fault, and then they come back they put all the data on the spreadsheet and then this this class is going to get this information and simulate the fault using those data from the spreadsheet. So next, they're going to use, so the first one, they use uh, stream power, linear diffuser, and flow accumulator, and now we are using normal fault component. So it's so now we're gonna use, uh, now we're gonna run with the fault included here, the fault component. So it's kind of hard to see here the fault, but you can see then the profiles that is something happened here that is a nick point related to this fault. So if, if you go next, please, it's, yeah, the next one, please. Yeah, so then like, this is like the homework <laughs> oh yeah and the homework you can see the yeah yeah so as an extra exercise we also included this notebook to explore some metrics related to steady state from the dm data and we encourage the students to repeat the process using the synthetic data and this is our project <laughs> developed during aspen uh thank you for being here and if you have any questions we'll be happy to answer them <laughs> Great, thank you. We'll open it up. <laughs> open it up for questions from anyone who would like to ask the team a question. I'm giving people like <laughs> A bit of time to formulate we can like also like entertain the questions in the chat if you like want to type them in the chat and i could like read them out loud um i just wanted to like say like how cool i thought um that in this project um you worked with field data but you keep it like as a, it's as if it's a virtual field trip um and i think as a community in the earth sciences we are starting to like catch on to the idea that like some students are doing much more like computational work and they're like interested in like data science as an application. And so this seems to like really be a useful resource for teachers or um, um, like instructors um, to, to give people an idea of um, field data that would be collected and then play with this with the processes. So I'm really grateful for that. And I am gonna like advertise it with some colleagues for that reason. Um, Greg, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, this is very cool. Can you tell us more about the image in this slide? What are we seeing here? Ah, uh, so this is uh, a GIF from the evolution because we were trying to evolve the DM until it reached like the uplift will be the same as the erosion rate to kind of achieve somewhat of a steady state. So then we use your code, Greg, to generate this GIF. Because <laughs> I, I think that, you know, uh, students really like to to see um, GIFs. So we thought it would be nice. <laughs> but I think it, uh, as Irina was saying, uh, beyond having this, this, you know, this project being a way to also integrate students with modeling in general, uh, there's also this part of the project uh, 
that is giving accessibility also uh, because you know maybe a student cannot go to the field trip but want to be part of it so they can use the field data to you know import the field data to to a project like this and and get a conclusion out of it so that's also something that we were thinking about when developing these notebooks Very cool, thank you. Um, our next team um, will have Larry, um, Shu, Yo Hung Lai. Perfect. Um, present. Don't call me Larry. <laughs> Larry uh, Lai. Yeah. Uh, of the University of Washington, um, and he's on. Uh, he will like introduce his larger team. Thank you. All right. Uh, can everybody see it? Okay, well, uh, this is Larry Lai, a postdoc from UW, and I'm representing team uh, listen here uh, for the event settlement post team. Uh, then we're specifically interested in how fluvial landscape will respond to deep sea landslide events. Uh, specifically, we are interested in a uh, topic is a connectivity between hill slope and rivers, um, because we know that due to climate change, you know, earthquake, we've got a lot of landslide happening recently, and it's impacting our life and landscape. But some landslides have happened and they stay on a hill slope because they're not, they're kind of disconnected from the uh, river and maybe it's dry or maybe it's just landfall itself. Uh, whereas some landslide actually happens right nearby the rivers, like and also landslide in Northwest Pacific or in Taiwan with a lot of landslide, but river can directly bring the sediment down to the ocean. So we want to know how this connectivity factor control. Uh, how fast the landscape will respond to landslide events and how fast the sediment pulse generated by landslide can be uh, translated into the system. And that's kind of an important topic that many researchers are working on. So in this uh, uh, notebook, we design a simple uh, two extreme scenario hypothesis testing. So one is the high connectivity scenarios, low, one is low connectivity scenarios. When we adapt this uh, a variety of different components from one lab 2.7, uh, we first set up the a fake landscape using a space model. So it's a simple stream power based model with uh, some ac accounting cover effect, and we set up to reach a, a, a semi state state landscape. Then we fail the landscape uh, using highland, and so there's a better right land slider. But meanwhile, in a good connective scenarios, we also turn on a a uh, new component, the gravel barrel eroder, which account uh, bed low sediment transport and saltation and abrasion effect for 20 years. Then we turn off the landslide and we keep letting the river do its works for many years and see how the sediment pulse being delivered through the system. On the contrary, uh, we use, we set up the bed connective scenarios. So we use exactly the same fake landscape but we only turn on landslide for 20 years without river decision. Then we turn on rivers for the same amount of time and see the difference between these two scenarios. And lastly, we run this model with this real world landscape and see whether this model will work in the real world landscape. So that's the design of this notebook. So first we import a bunch of uh, components and we write a lot of functions. So it's a recent update for this notebook is basically we functionalize a lot of things because we keep repeating using those code. So this is a plot uh, function that we will generate plots that you will see later. We set up the grid and it's a function for uh, initial uh, models. We initialize components with the uh, parameters. This is the function for set up the fake landscape, initial landscape, the function for good connectivity scenarios, and the function for bad connectivity scenarios. All right, let's dive in. Uh, so first, like I say, I use we use the uh, space model to generate a fake landscape, and here's the result. We're running five thousand years, and this is a fake square drainage uh, drainage basin with only one outlet, and this this is the sediment thickness uh, over the whole landscape here, and this is the long profile along the main trunk of the river, and the orange line is the sediment thickness cover. Okay, now this is the initial states of our our hypothesis testing. Now we start landsliding for 20 years. And in good connected scenarios, we run the systems going through 
in the first 20 years because it lands a lot happening in some places. So you can see the lens, uh, sound landscape got smoothed a little bit, but the sediment can directly go into the river system really fast. And we got really thick uh, sediments covering the system already, like 60 meters. Then after turning off the lens slides, we started running the system, keep running the system for 50 years. Yeah, you can see sediments start being transported. Some interesting erosion happens. Uh, 100 years, you keep the sediment still there, but it's much thinner. But after 1,000 years, surprising, uh, all the sediment are gone. But uh, you can see the, length, uh, the river profile actually react to this uh, event by uh, forming some weird uh, nick zones. Over 5,000 years, the nick zone's gone. 10,000 years, the landscape remains similar. And you may see that the, the sediment is covered is like 60 meters is crazy. No, uh, this is my hometown, Taiwan. Uh, one landslide can generate 80 meters deposit. Easy, easy peasy. So not a not a problem. And it, it actually pretty good representative of how good kind of this scenario can happen in real world. Okay, then next is the back on like scenarios. And you can see we set up the uh, failure for 20 years without river. So some grids have been failed and so no sediment cover, but some sediment uh, material got re removed from hill slope, but they're not directly connected to the channel. And so in this case, channel profile at first, there's no sediment cover. Then we run a system. So let it keep, keep doing it works. 50 years, some sediment start to go into the river. Then 100 years, more sediment going in. Not a lot, but then 1,000 years, more sediment coming in. 5,000 years, sediment still there. And 10,000 years, still somewhere there, but you know, channel profile, keep doing what its work, but cannot go into a new city state roughly at time. Later on, uh, you we use the uh, coral the front range. It is a landscape, and we generate a fake slide at the nick zone right here. So a bunch of sediments, and we do similar process for back connected minerals. And you can see the model just modeling the wave of sediment pod going through down and all the way to ten thousand years. And also, you can see the nick zone actually retreat a little bit. So there's a key finding here, interestingly, that the high concave scenario based on this model, uh, the sediment can be, uh, general brand can be evacuated really quickly in like 100 time, year time scale. Um, we actually can form nick zone with nick, nick points just because of landslide sediment cover. Uh, in low connected scenarios, uh, the landscape need to respond, uh, spend more time responding to a landslide event, maybe at a time scale of 1,000 years, maybe. Uh, on the hill slope, and then like the exterior landscape may need more time to recover in the low climate and in many places. So this is kind of the the ex uh, experience that we demonstrate in this lab, and people can use the version four to rep uh, uh, just do exactly the same thing that we did. Uh, we also include a new version five, which basically do the same thing, but we actually have. Uh, animation functions in the version five. So you can uh, like see in here, there's the animations start from zero. You can see sediment wave transport down a bunch of GIF you can generate from the version five. I think that's our notebooks and that's the lab and work on any questions. Thank you. That looked awesome. So we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Larry, for presenting on behalf of your team. I think Shelby's hand is up. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <Very> Good. <laughs> okay. Um, Larry, that was amazing. I know you guys have sort of an abridged timeline to work on this. And I don't know if I saw this right, but it seemed like in the good connectivity scenario, the landslides had the capacity to alter the river profile versus in the bad connectivity scenario, the river profile sort of stayed constant as it transported the sediment through, even though it was slow. Did you do any further investigation? I can't remember what that initial, yeah, it looked like it got steeper yeah, it, on the up near the headwaters. Um, yeah. And have you thought Maybe about continuing, concave. yeah, looking at more profile scale metrics to see what that, land sliding does, yeah. Great questions. Uh, I think it's definitely some talk that I'm highly interested in keep doing and more, more experienced. But there's a few things uh, we notice and we want to emphasize. This is just a simple experience. 
And second, maybe space, uh, the scale issues is a thing. So this is a very small drainage. Uh, and we have some uplift rate in here, the background uplift rate here. So we, we, you know, and also tons of landslide happen right away. So they stack the sediment cover uh, and the the nature of the gravel barrel eroder, how that uh, behave may be important in governing whether this channel profile uh, works. So we, I personally want to test this in other landscape or maybe larger incision landscape or maybe using different incision functions like using just space or just basic stream power model to try whether we see difference. But uh, just in this case with some other control uh, factors with this small uh, drainage, we do see this uh, behaviors that we just described. So it's an interesting topic and I I'm not sure whether that's realistic. Uh, I personally want to see any real landscape or with similar skill, I might try to test the same, same idea. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Are there, hey, are there... uh, sorry, can you hear me? It's Laurent here. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, uh, so you talked about comparing space and the gravel bedrock eroder. Um, I've, I've done a similar situation to your, oh, nice. uh, high connectivity example, you, but using space to erode the deposits. And I found those take like 10,000 years or more often to erode. Obviously, uh, I, I have no idea how our parameters kind of align, <laughs> but it's really yeah. interesting to see, uh, that, you know, I've got maybe a couple orders of magnitude longer residence time of deposits uh when i'm using yeah i guess a, a different erosion different model, model. so uh, i think definitely it's something probably the nature up. yeah i think especially the, the, the difference between the gravel barrel eroder and the space and in particular uh, gravel barrel eroder from my understanding which is new uh but it, it account tool effects so maybe that's mm -hmm. a factor and second is um that uh, what i gonna say oh i i realized and when i do further testing and refining modeling creating the the animation time step matters uh so if you use much smaller time step or much longer time step, the model actually behave very differently uh so that's one thing i'm not sure whether that's realistic and i think maybe we can compare that your design in terms of time step and my design time, time step and see how the difference so it's a lot of interesting question that we can explore in this system yeah yeah, yeah, really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Those All animations right. are like really great addition. And like they usually function super well when people are like trying to play with scenarios. So thanks for doing that. Um, our next uh, two speakers are Katrina Cruz Magno and Pratt Regni, um, they tackled, they were interested in tackling a coupling problem and tackled a quite um, difficult coupling uh, problem in a bit different system than what we just saw before. So I'm excited to hear um, the combination with Dorado and uh, the particle tracking. So Katrina and Pratt, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. You can. Uh, can you see my screen? We maybe see it. I, maybe I see it. See you, it. you might want to like make it one more, a little bit bigger. Uh, okay. Let me check. On my computer, that works with like command plus. Oh, yeah. We do see it. Uh, you. Okay. Let's do it this. Oh, okay. There you are. It's big. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
Sorry. Let's go. Okay. Hello everyone. I'm Pratik Sharegmi. I'm a PhD student at NC State University. And thank you so much CSTMS for providing us incredible opportunity this summer. So we learn a lot. We make like great connections. So, so I want to thank of much for you and um, uh, uh, my uh, uh, group uh, project wa was topic uh, coupling overland flow with Dorado particle tracking after wildfire and our group members are Sujana, uh, Nikki, Nak and Katrina. I would like to thank them a lot. Uh, they were uh, well, they also wanted to present this, but because of the time constraint and all, um, they are not here. Susanna is here. She was about to present, but because she was not feeling well, so uh, and she did not uh, do this. And Katrina and I will be presenting today. And um, our project was um, Coughlin Overland Flow in Dorado. And uh, uh, these two models are traditionally independent, but uh, in this project, we uh, try to couple them to f uh, track the flow of particles during rainfall event after the wildfire. And um, in this project, we aim to provide a comprehensive tool for runoff generation and particle tracking by combining strength of uh, overland flow hydrodynamic simulations and Dora tools particle um, tracking capabilities. And uh, first of all, uh, we uh, let's go through this notebook. And uh, at the beginning, uh, we install API keys for CDS um, data and open topography data. For CD, uh, we need CDS API key to uh, download precipitation data and open topography to download topography data. So and. Um, uh, we downloaded, um, we used topographic uh, data component to de download digital elevation model with 30 meter resolution. And um, we can see in this notebook, this is the topographic data we downloaded. And uh, for this, um, uh, let me see. Uh, in this um, project, we used uh, um, Northwest of Boulder, which was impacted by Calwood fire, occurred in 2020 for, for uh, to test this uh, combination of overland flow and Dorado. And uh, this is the topography we used for this analysis. And uh, we used uh, ERA 5 data component to download hourly uh, precipitation data with uh, 27 to 28 uh, kilometer resolution. And uh, in this uh, uh, um, uh, data set, uh, you'll notice that all the ERA 5 and topographic data component download the data set from different uh, resources. They are using same methods to get information from data sets. And, um, um, this is the uh, visualization of precipitation data set and uh, uh, let me see. The, this plot shows the uh, hourly pre total precipitation on June 25, 2021 and uh, this uh, the use of this study area locates area within uh, that within the area that is covered by pixel at the bottom left and uh, uh, this code block shows the um, ERAS5 data time, uh, ERAS5, which was run for time series data set. And uh, since we are coupling overland and Dorado, uh, for overland flow, we need uh, to delineate water set. And in, um, uh, for that, we use topography data. Uh, topography data f uh, and land lab components such as flow accumulator, channel profile, and also the land lab utility gate water set mask to um, generate the water sets. And that uh, generated water set uh, was later on used uh, for overland flow uh, analysis. And this is the other code used for generating water set. And this is this was the mask for water set. And uh, 
at the end for uh, we used uh, uh, the water set generated from topography elevation uh, for overland flow simul component simulation and um, uh, for this uh, uh, if for the input to, since we are coupling two models uh, overland flow and dorato model overland flow gives uh, us uh, output um, uh, which has Q, um, qx qy stays in depth but uh, dorado uh, input for dorado we need uh, qx qy uh, stays in depth so we need to uh, add stays to the model uh, stays to the output of overland flow so this code block um, is used to generate the stays and uh, also since we are using output from overland flow uh, which will be used as an input for dorado so um, output from overland flow is 1d array which is in the form of qx and qy component but for the dorado will need them in 2d form so here we are recipping one day array to uh, 2d for the input in dorado model and uh, yeah and um, output from overland flow is uh, at the end it is uh, exported as a net cdr file which will be used as an input for dorado model so at this code block we we are exporting all the outputs from overland flow to netcdf file and then i want to pass this to katrina my group mate who will explain more about dorado thank you thanks Prati. um yeah thanks everyone for coming today i'm also going to share my screen because i think i will be easier for me so could you stop sharing Prati, please Okay. We're seeing it. Great. Okay. Cool. So yeah, thanks Prati for going over um, the overland flow component of our work. I'm going to discuss the work that we did for um, Dorado, the particle tracker. So the main science question that we were um, attempting to answer is how does the number of wildfire acres or the, no, the number of acres of land um, that's been affected by wildfire um, affect maybe the pH of uh, water downstream. So we're using the uh, there we go, sorry. We're using the Dorado particle tracker to essentially transport, um, to essentially transport ash particles that uh, would make its way downstream and affect the pH. So we'll do a little bit of some chemistry, a few lines of chemistry at the end. Um, but okay, so taking the input, or sorry, the output of the overland uh, flow model, I feed it into Dorado and so, here we have this nice uh, set of four plots showing the stage depth X component and Y component of, of discharge for um, our, our field site. And so, uh, like I said, there, there are definitely some assumptions that we have to make for um, wildfire acreage and, and kind of what, how much, how many ash particles come from one, um, like acreage of burnt land. So uh, I got this number, one meter squared of land is equal to 1.6 uh, kilograms of, uh, sorry, one meter squared of land equals 1.6 kilograms of ash. Let's see this paper here. Um, and so in general, I'm just going to, well, I basically uh, assume that uh, one particle is equal to one particle of ash is equal to um, 1.6 kilograms. So I guess important to note is that in Dorado, it's a Lagrangian particle tracker, but this particle could be anything. It has no physical characteristics. It's just something that we're we're following along using our um, affection equations. So, um, 
So right now it's kind of it's a bit abstract, but it is we're assuming that it's an um, an ash particle, and so we generate these particles, um, and the number of particles, as I said, is uh, depends on the amount of wildfire acres acreage. So um, if I say twenty acres, then we have sixty four ash particles. Just, um, parameterization, and then I want to run this for five hours. So five hours and 60 seconds. And then the fun part, we run the uh, we run the Dorado model, model and see that a lot of particles never uh, actually move uh, beyond their initial position. So you can see that here actually. So I think this was a problem that we had been facing previously where a lot of our particles were getting stuck. And um, I put a grid on this for reasons you'll see later, but um, yes, uh, back in the workshop, a lot of our particles were just kind of staying in this area, um, but uh, we were able to figure out uh, the correct placement. We also notably increased the depth by a factor of 10 to get this. So I think going forward, um, we need to try new field sites, new kinds of topography um, to get significant uh, particle transport. So I'm gonna be looking at what the pH is in this box here where a bunch of particles end up. And so, let's see, first I wanna know how many particles even ended up in that area. Okay, so if I specify that box that I, that square that I showed earlier, then um, you determine that there are about five particles in that area. And, um, then we can do that, those few lines of chemistry <laughs> that I mentioned and get uh, a pH, a, a basic pH. So it's becoming, because of the ash particles, the um, potassium hydroxide in the transported ash causes the pH to increase above seven. Um, and so I kind of put together, this isn't well integrated into the Jupyter notebook, but I just put together a plot showing how when we increase that, um, the acreage, sorry, should be acreage of, of um, wildfire land, the pH increases with it. Not quite linear, but um, yes. So an interesting, this actually this plot could be made um, by a student, I imagine, just to um, really demonstrate how much uh, ash production can affect the pH downstream. So yes, but that that is what we have thus far. And thanks for joining us and listening in. Thank you, Katrina and um, Pratt. That was like um, a nice overview of like two different modeling systems and like how you needed to like overcome these like things of figuring out what kind of input does the one model take and then adjusting what is the output of the other model, um, but also like running it through into something that we hadn't explored before um, and like a physical process that I think is of like great interest to like many students. Um, are there any questions for Katrina and Pratt? Seems like Greg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. That was really interesting. I'm curious why your particles are getting stuck. Do you think yeah. it's because the, I mean, are there areas where there's essentially zero velocity because there's no water to move? And is that maybe happening because there's run on infiltration? So the basically water that was flowing soaks into the ground. And in which case, is that real? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know if Susanna or Rati, you I want can, to? I can take that question. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I think, um, so the major issue that we faced while modeling this was that the precipitation data that we are using and the runoff that it was generating was very low. It was around like 0 0.3 meter depth. So all, like because of the lower depth, as well as the topography of the region, the particles seem to got, get like stuck. So once we increase the depth, so what we have done right now is we have manually increased the depth. So we tried, I think um, when we tried the minimum amount of depth needed for some of the particles to be moving in the channel was around like one meters um, compared to like 0 0.3 meters what we had before. Um, but the thing is that 
we are just manually changing the depth and not necessarily the discharge. That's also an important factor. So I think that's a very important aspect to look at if we want to elaborate it further, is that like, what's the minimum amount of depth that we need and the discharge associated with the depth that we need to figure out, especially for the topography um, that we are seeing. And I think uh, one of the very interesting aspect that I think we saw was that once the particles started, like even for a one meter depth, once the particles started like moving in the channel, the movement was not towards the outlet, but towards like the upstream, which I think might be also because we are not like, we don't have the exact same um, discharge for the depth that we are associating it with, or maybe there's there are like some other physical processes that goes on with that. So I think if you look at the animation, you can see the particles moving like upstream towards the channel, um, some of them, which I thought was very interesting. I mean, uh, I can add to that because I know this case study well from like working there a bit with like field student work um, that the uh, Tian, Tian used the ERA as a demonstration to make it very general. But like, if you look on the local rain gauge, there was like a very different like storm magnitude. So, so I think one way of mitigating the fact that if you use a like a global scale reanalysis is like to use local rain gauge data for these like very small catchments. I think what um, Katrina said too, like choosing a um, catchment that has a more robust discharge or like a larger like flow through it is maybe another option to make this a, um, um, a bit more um, efficient in its like transport of material. Maybe we don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But some of the power lies also in your explanations, I think, of like Thing, people getting people to think about like what does, does ash do where does it end up in the landscape like how fast would that be is it a single rainstorm um so so i think even if like not everything's working yet i think the whole <laughs> like concept is really a teachable um concept already so quite pleased yes thank you yeah i think it'd be really cool to look at this for different yeah scenarios um and ash I, if we were looking at something that was like much heavier, then I think that perhaps this wouldn't be a very useful, I guess, way of 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 tracking it. Um, but ash is so light, <laughs> just goes with the water. So, um, yeah, yeah, stop okay. shooting. Are there any other questions for this group? Cool. Well, we'll, look, we'll move to um, Sarah Brown. She's at LSU as well. Um, and she'll be presenting on behalf of the groups that worked on the impact of, uh, impact of, of vegetation and uh, on coastal resilience. Um, and there's a bit on dunes and there's a bit on deltaic stuff, I think. Yes. So, hi, I'm Sarah Branham. I'm a PhD student at LSU, as Irina mentioned. And our group wanted to look at the effect of vegetation on sediment transport. And we focused on two main coastal environments. We wanted to focus on a dune, which is primarily driven by aeolian transport, and a delta, which is um, driven by like water transport. And so we have two different sort of like sets of codes in two different notebooks, but we have like an overview section and the different models that each of the notebooks sort of focus on. So I guess I'll start with the dunes piece. Um, let me open it up. So we wanted to focus a lot on like introductory material for um, people that aren't quite as familiar with um, like how vegetation might influence sediment transport. So Bart made this very awesome figure, <laughs> but um, for the dune piece, um, we have a lot of introductory material on how aeolian transport works and um, focusing on that like human nature-based solution component. So um, in the notebook, you look at the impact of um, like vegetation, but also um, these like hard structures like a house or um, like a sand fence to sort of facilitate that sediment deposition and build up the dune. And so there's different um, 
like code blocks, the um, notebook here uses the basic model interface to couple Aeolus, which is an Aeolian model, with a vegetation growth and development model by changing like the shear reduction or like shear strength at each of the cells with vegetation. And so there's a bunch of code that does that, but basically um, when you run it, you get these um, figures of sediment building up over time in areas where the vegetation is present or where the um, like sand fences are present. And so we have three different like cases for that with vegetation, sand fence, and then like no no sort of barrier at all to kind of facilitate how alien transport might impact those different areas. And then um, for the Delta piece, we used a, um, so we have um, some introductory material about um, coastal land loss in Louisiana, which is primarily um, river Delta environment and how vegetation might um, in influence those areas. And we used uh, Pi Delta RCM, which is just a um, numerical model that tracks um, like sediment and um, water transport in these deltaic environments. And so we basically run two different scenarios where we have vegetation present and vegetation not present. And you get these um, two different GIFs where you run it. So this is the example of the um, scenario with no vegetation present. And the um, vegetation, um, so you can see like the delta is growing and there's sediment being deposited out on those outer lobes. And then um, when you add vegetation, we see um, sort of a different shape in the um, system as we get these deeper channels, as the channels, as the flow is being more localized to um, specific areas where the vegetation isn't present. And um, the Pi Delta RCM vegetation component works by um, updating every time when the um, the thymetry gets above a certain level, it says there's vegetation present, and then we add it. And it's based on this like fractional component. So um, both of these together can kind of look at how um, like the influence of vegetation would impact um, land building. And there's a lot of applications to both of these together or sort of separate. We kind of had problems with thinking about how to combine these. And like, there's a lot of confounding variables, but just in general, looking at nature-based solutions and like coastal resiliency. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for like presenting on that, Sarah, and for um, showing um, both that th these are, these were like two large teams uh, um, and you're presenting mm -hmm. on behalf of everyone. Um, are there any questions for Sarah? Go for it, Greg. Yeah, I'm curious um, what what kind of challenges you ran into in trying to do this. So you're working with two different models, Eolus and Pi Delta RCM. Um, and I don't know much about Eolus. Is it natively written in Python or was this a code that had been wrapped and you were using BMI or how did that work? So we worked pretty independently and I was not on the Aeolus team. I was on the Pi Delta RCM. But as far as I understand, I I don't know if it's written originally in Python, but um the they did use like the BMI to like sort of wrap it as you were mentioning before and like have that update, but I'm not sure exact. I mean, it's all in here, so you're welcome to take a look too. I'll probably take a look at some point more thoroughly too, but I am not 100% sure how it's like exactly wrapped around there. Like there's some Aeolus wrapper, but yeah. I, I think uh, it does have an, uh, a BMI that's a little bit similar to like the maybe the ones that Delteris uses um, since um, some of the main developers there were there too. Um, I see Shelby's hands up. Hey, Sarah, that was really cool. Um, you talked a little bit about this being applicable to nature-based solutions. And one of my thoughts was you could sort of optimize. We're not hearing you very clear, Shelby. Is it better? My network is terrible.
you were good before. So like that. I think, well, I heard nature-based solutions in there. So I guess I can talk about that for a second because a lot of the um, nature-based solutions focusing on like sediment, um, like sedimentation in these deltaics and like aeolian systems are dependent or, or like really focus on vegetation as being this like natural savior, I guess, specifically in like deltaic environments. There's a lot of efforts for um, like vegetation maintenance and even like restoration plantings. And similar in, in aeolian environments, there's a lot of like dune building that's really encouraged by planting vegetation. So there's a lot of applications to what we've done, I guess. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we hear you. The better. That's exactly what I was going to ask. And if you were to use this model in that context, um, what parameter would you output to sort of understand what type of vegetation is most like commensurate with retaining sediment or inhibiting sediment. I don't know. Would it be like a change in elevation or like persistence of different channels? Maybe this is very vague, but. Um, no, no, I, I think it makes it. sense. And um, a lot of, I'm not sure about Aeolia, uh, Aeolus as much, but in Pi Delta RCM, the vegetation is modeled as like, like stiff cylinders essentially. And so um, one of the big parameters is the like density of those like stems together, which can correlate to both like the health of the vegetation, but also like vegetation types that grow in a lot denser stands compared to other types. So that would be one of the main variables that can be changed. And um, I guess also like any of these models can be like stopped and you can be like, here's a chunk of vegetation that we just planted. Let's see if it is able to stay in the system or if it impacts the system as a whole. So yeah, like those types of like, I guess like engineering aspects of like manually tweaking specific things. And I guess the converse side of that is like, if there's vegetation die off due to yeah, either like increased like inundation over time or like any sort of disease or climate change in general, you can model that vegetation stem density like decreasing over time. Yeah, so what you just mentioned, uh, um, I think is a really interesting idea too, to um, think about these as like simple tools for like a manager or like somebody who's like needs to uh, make decisions about like where to plant vegetation or uh, whether like interventions are needed. Could they like interact with the system and so this is something that in the human dimensions group in csd mass uh, like is like people are starting to develop better um tools for those kind of like interactions with policymakers or interactions with managers um and i think this notebook is maybe amongst the notebooks like one of the ones that um hits that interface the the most closely so it'll be cool mm -hmm. Last questions. Well, thank you to um, everyone who uh, stepped up to present on behalf of their groups. Um, I um, just love like how this showcases like how far people can get when you have like a group of like two to four to six uh, people kind of setting their minds to it and like using some of these tools and building upon the resources that are there um, and like the connections that are built are like there for even longer um, than the, the uh, specific notebooks. And so for like community members as a whole, these uh, notebooks are in like a GitHub repository um, that's posted with Espin and then um, we will be posting this webinar. So like for people who missed it um, or couldn't attend because of other conflicting meetings, um, the like resource will be there for everybody. So thank you again to everybody for like attending, for presenting, and just for like a great overview of what 2024 Aspen cohort was doing. <laughs>